tell me, does House of the Dragon just hate daylight for some reason? I need to talk about this before I talk about anything else. I am hijacking this review. <laughs> I am not someone who notices technical directory photography stuff very much. I just don't know about it. It doesn't bother me that much when it's bad, okay? But the lighting in this episode was very distracting. Like, that was the problem. I was, you know, I was talking to my girlfriend and, and she was like, yeah, this is really hard to look at sometimes. It wasn't even the lighting though. I'm pretty sure that they filmed some scenes during the day, you know, like Damon and Rhaenyra sexing it up on the beach, uh, Amond claiming Vega. But then when they went into like, I don't know, post-production or something, they realized that a bunch of scenes didn't fit together in the timeline and they needed to take place at night. So instead of reshooting them or something, they just turned the brightness down or had like a like an Instagram night filter? I don't know. In some scenes, people are just these brownish blots of color. And lighting is something I have mentioned before. House of the Dragon is a very darkly lit show, and even during the day, like, it's very cold lighting. It's very dusty. Again, I don't really care about the critical elements of that. It doesn't really bother me that much, but it's just, it's just not as nice to look at, you know? Am I... Am I wrong for thinking this? Am I alone? I don't know. Tell me down below. Anyways, the review. House of the Dragon is about battle lines being drawn, people picking sides, the board being set, and the pieces moving. And th there's a great little moment with Helena Targaryen, who seems to have some kind of prophecy or foresight ability, where she says, uh, the hand turns the loom, spools of green, a spool of black, dragons of flesh weaving dragons of thread. This is referring to Otto, the hand of the king, again, driving the realm towards war and the different Targaryen factions. We've got the greens, who are Alicent's faction, and the blacks, who are Rhaenyra's faction. I think this is also the first episode where we get like an explicit mention of the greens. I, I may be wrong about that, I don't know, uh, but I have to ask, which side are you on? Greens or blacks? I cringe at myself saying that, but um, it's hella good for YouTube engagement. <laughs> the core of this episode is the fight that goes on between the kids, where Amond loses his eye and becomes who we will know him as, Amond One-Eye. Just like in the previous episode, the kids are playing out this proxy fight between the parents, the adults, uh, except this time they seem to take it up more themselves, like violence is something inherited here. Rather than them just being egged on by the adults around them, though the adults are egging them on, one detail I really appreciated was that, you know, Amond looks like he was going to go and console Rhaenyra's kids for losing Harwin, their real dad, but he didn't say anything because that's tantamount to basically saying, we know you bastards, right? <laughs> Neither Amond nor Aegon seem to want this conflict to happen, but it is very much pushed on them by the adults around them. A huge theme in the Dance of Dragons is revenge. It's about how violence begets violence and also how we can lose ourselves in violence. And we see this perhaps most vividly in Alicent this episode, where she demands an eye of Rhaenyra's child as punishment in return, even going so far as to try and take it out herself. It is very literally the old biblical adage of, you know, an eye for an eye. This whole scene, by the way, is taken directly from the books, right down to Amon's line where he says, you know, I lost an eye but gained a dragon and I counted a, a fair exchange. Uh, also, in this whole sequence, they, I think this was the first time I really got a sense for how big Vega was, how, how, you know, huge and powerful and ancient she was. Really nicely done by the visual effects people. But there were some interesting decisions and changes between the book and show that complicate my feelings around Alicent, you know, trying to take out the eye of the child. I really like Alicent's role in the story. I love the line that she had in this episode, you know, where she says, what have I done, uh, but what is expected of me? Forever upholding the kingdom, the family, the law, while you flout all and do as you please. Where is duty? Where is sacrifice? You know, as battle lines are being drawn, this is at the heart of it. That is a really believable sentiment, you know, why she would resent Rhaenyra, but uh, Alicent in the show is a lot more sympathetic than she is in the books. She's kind of that horrible stepmother archetype a little bit, or that's, that's how she's 
portrayed by the historians. You've got to remember that this is written with the biases of the maesters and stuff like that. But because she is so much more sympathetic in the show, I was thinking her trying to gouge this kid's eye out was a little bit of a, a jump for her character. You know, kind of like um, Kristen Cole killing Joffrey. It very much fit her book counterpart more, even though I could see where that came from in the show. Uh, but, you know, I really like Alicent as this person who abhors violence, but is surrounded by people who are willing to do heinous things for her. Laris and Kristen and Otto, she is like a frog who is slowly boiling in water and doesn't quite know it's happening, doesn't know how to escape it, trying to absolve herself of blame, but repeatedly finding herself in places where violence is just the conclusion of events, you know? I think that is her most interesting dynamic, personally. The, the scene where Laris later on says, you know, I could go do this for you. I could go and take out that kid's eye. And she says, no, but I may need a friend like that one day, you know, or where later in the episode, she tells Otto, I regret doing this. I disgraced myself. This was horrible. I should not have done this. And Otto says, ah, you know what? I like it. <laughs> I really like those beats because the story has explored her lack of agency because she is so committed to the law and her virtue and sacrifice and duty and having that lead her down a really tragic path where violence is the only option or it's necessary if she wants to continue her dedication to the law and virtue and her duty. I think that's really interesting. Trying to resist these horrible parts, you know, trying to resist the horrible parts of the Game of Thrones, we play an ugly game, but not being able to. A lot of this comes down to, of course, the story they are trying to tell. This is really hard to adapt, and I think they've done it about as well as they can, uh, but, you know, they are having to jump from year to year, from plot beat to plot beat, and that doesn't necessarily give them a huge amount of room if they're trying to maneuver all these characters into the right positions before the dance begins. But I think I wish that Alicent hadn't tried to take the eye of a child herself, you know, because that puts the violence in her hands. When I find that dynamic of her, you know, resisting the violence that are done by others around her, uh, the most interesting kind of part of her story. And it might have lost her a little bit of sympathy that they may have wanted to keep with her. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, this is just a fun thought experiment for me. I really enjoyed what they're doing with it anyway. And when we talk about, you know, revenge begetting revenge and violence begetting violence, you know, we're seeing how all the different characters kind of view these events. And for Alicent, it's it's justice. She has lived her entire life by the rules and is, is, is feeling, you know, put out because she has abided by the rules her entire life and sacrificed so much for it. And everyone else should have to as well. You know, you can see why Rhaenyra frustrates her so much. She's destabilizing the realm by having these bastard children while Alicent is like, hey, I'm I'm gonna have sex with my corpse husband. <laughs> so it's this complicated mix of emotions where yeah, it's about virtue and the rules, but it's also about envy and self-righteousness, isn't it? On the other hand, I really loved Rhaenyra this episode. I am really buying into her character and story. It's great. Uh, I loved the scene between her and Lenor talking about their marriage, recognizing that duty and happiness don't always go hand in hand, and Rhaenyra saying, you know, I, I, I really did want to bear your children, we tried. I, I love that because uh, it, it reminds me of one of my favorite scenes in Game of Thrones, uh, where Cersei and Robert talk honestly about their marriage. You know, where they say, you know, was there any chance for us? And Robert says, you know, I, I can't even remember Lyanna's face, if I'm being honest. It's a fantastic look at finding the people inside the politics of these shows. And this leads really nicely into a change from the books regarding Leonor. So, in the book, he is murdered. We're only told that the circumstances of Leonor's murder remain a mystery to this day. One source declares jealousy the motive of slaying. Leonor Valarion had grown wary of Sir Carl's companionship. Or perhaps Prince Damon paid uh, Carl Corey to dispose of Princess Rhaenyra's husband, arranged for a ship to carry him away. Corey was known to have a lord's tastes and a peasant's purse. Parts of this all prove to be true. Damon does pay Carl to do something, and he does have, you know, a lord's tastes and a peasant's money. But no, Leonor does survive, and he goes off and has a happily gay ever after with his boyfriend in Essos. Uh, I think that this was the right decision to make. And it's not actually necessarily a change from the books. Of course, being a mystery, you can interpret it a number of ways. Uh, but um, it shows Damon's maturity and how he deals with stuff. It shows Rhaenyra's kindness, um, her morality. And it gave the story a little bit of happiness that I think it's earned. But what did you think? Let me know down below. 
Uh, I also really, really loved the Valerian wedding between Rhaenyra and Daemon. It had this ancient, otherworldly kind of style to it. It felt like harking back to an age of the past. And it was a nice bit of world building that fits in with the superiority complex of the Targaryens. But the episode is dominated by scenes where characters draw lines in the sand and say, we will fight here, you know. And not just with a vague sense of loyalty, but with uh, a real kind of belief that they are going to have to stand by that line one day. Uh, we did it with Corlys, with Rhaenys, Lanor, Otto, Daemon, tons of them. Leonor picked a side when he went to Rhaenyra and said, happiness and duty don't go well together. I am picking duty. I am picking you. We are going to put you on the throne and our kids are going to follow them. And of course, he gets to go off anyway. But Corlys and Rhaenys have this frank conversation that Rhaenyra's kids do not belong to Leonor. But Corlys says, you know, history does not remember blood. It remembers names. And these kids are going to bear the Valarion names. So they have decided we're sticking with them. This is his legacy. Call it ambition. Call it love. Call it a lust for power or a mix of them all. Similarly, Damon has been kind of sidelined for this episode, as he has been for the last couple. When Viserys asks him, hey, come to court, he says, no, my home is in Pentos. I don't need anything from you, basically. He stands and watches the drama unfold around him, rather than because of him. See, he still has this bitterness, right? But he's dealt with that by basically running away, by not picking a side until this episode. Here he definitively chooses Rhaenyra in some sense in marrying her. Is it for him? Is it for Rhaenyra? Is it for the family? Also, that line where he says, you know, if you're accusing me of some depravity, you'll have to be more specific. It's, it's just great because it's, it is straight up the meme. <laughs> you killed my father. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Otto has the scene with Alicent at the end, you know, where he says, I didn't know you had it in you to win the Game of Thrones, but you do. Uh, and he remarks on how Aemon won Vega to their side. Uh, of course, Otto had picked his line a long time ago. He knows what side he is on. Uh, but he is talking in terms where it's like, this fight is going to happen, it is inevitable. But I think this was the first episode where Alison maybe really internalized that this fight is going to happen, and she has to be on this particular side. Of course, as always, it seems like Viserys is the only one incapable of picking a side, and that makes everything worse. See, we have the shot after Aemon loses his eye that divides the room into the Blacks, with Rhaenyra and the Valarions, and the Greens, with Alicent and the Hightowers on the other side. And of course, Viserys is nowhere to be seen, because he is incapable of picking a side. He is falling apart. He even at one point uh, in this episode refers to Alicent as Emma, his previous wife. And to deal with this problem, he basically just says, shut up, move on, we are not talking about this, which is a very brush it under the rug approach and has not turned out well for him in the past. In the books, he does basically this multiple times, like with Damon and Otto. Uh, and he refuses to do kind of anything truly substantial, it seems. But fundamentally, the battle lines have been drawn. We know why they are there. We know what they mean for our characters. And I love this complex tapestry of different motivations and emotions for why people are picking the sides that they are. And if the series is gone, the stitches that hold them together are going to tear. What will happen then? I can already hear the music coming for the Dance of the Dragons. What did you think of this episode? Let me know. Stay nerdy and I'll see you in the future.